Hello and welcome to the Business of Betting podcast. Today I'm joined by the sports book consigliere. David, thank you very much for coming on. Before we get into this episode, make sure you follow us on Twitter, at BettingPod, and check out the website, businessofbetting.com. Guest suggestions are much appreciated. This podcast is proudly sponsored by Betfair Proprietary Limited. Betfair operates a betting exchange and is licensed in the Northern Territory of Australia. Residents of Australia can join Betfair by visiting betfair.com.au and support this podcast by using promo code BOBPOD. Please gamble responsibly. So thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy this episode of the Business of Betting podcast. Hello and welcome to the Business of Betting podcast. Today I'm joined by the sports book consigliere. David, thank you very much for coming on. Hey, Jake. Thanks for having me. This is a uh, you know, long-time fan, long-time listener, and uh, finally get to make the connection. Pretty good stuff. Well, it's, it's mutual, my friend. You're obviously the host of the, the GT's Cash Considerations podcast. I know you're an odds maker and risk analyst at CG Technology, so you're very much in the business. And obviously, the, the topic and theme of this podcast is, is about that. So I'm very excited to, to talk to you about all the different things over your career so far. And it's hard to pick one spot to start, but I love hearing you talk about the old days in Pittsburgh and, and Penn State on your show. So why don't you start there and, and give us some, I guess, background about where you come from and how that leads to where you are today. All right. Well, uh, yeah, I was born and raised in Pittsburgh. I uh, grew up, you know, born in 1970. So uh, a child of the, you know, Steelers and the Pirates when they were actually good, the We Are Family team. And then, you know, also played hockey. So I got involved with that. I got to see the Penguins. So sports was a big part of our lives in Pittsburgh and just in the Northeast in general. It's just different there than it is in a lot of places. And, um, you know, so you're around it. And back in the day, we were, we were doing fantasy leagues and, you know, did a bracket pool. I was one of the, I was the kid in the neighborhood that said, yeah, we'll pick a bracket pool for the NCAA tournament. And um, so all that stuff, you're around it. And then Pittsburgh in general, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, all that stuff. There's there's guys around that are doing other things and you're just around it. So I was always around a group of guys who referred to me as the kid and I learned and listened and kind of grew up around it, ended up going to school at Penn state and, you know, everybody talks sports and watches sports. And then you start to dabble in, you know, the parlay sheets and you, you know, you find someone to make bets with and you, you just, you're around the business and um, involved in it. And then, you know, one thing leads to another, you gra- I graduated school was a production uh, person at, at a TV station in Pittsburgh covering games. So, you know, my job is to go interview players after games and watch baseball games or watch football games, go to practices. So I'm around it and um, just just loving it but not making any money. And the opportunity came at the time. I was single and young and uh, late 20s. And someone says, you want to move? to um, the Caribbean and learn the sports book business. And of course, you know, I mean, you're from around the world, Jake. So for someone who's <laughs> from Pittsburgh and hadn't really traveled outside the United States at all, other than to Canada to go to Niagara Falls, um, that's a big move. And you're just like, uh, if, I mean, if somebody told me, could I move to Australia at first, there's hesitation, but it was a good time in my life. And I ended up going and I'll tell you what, I got a PhD in the business down there. So at that time, when you get that offer or it becomes a, a real tangible possibility to, to jump headfirst in the industry, is that a, I'm guessing it's not a normal path as a, you know, 20 something getting that opportunity, but is it something that you can legitimately do or the average young fella in, in the Northeast can do, or is it something that you really have to stretch for because it's not a normal way to get into the commercial world? I don't think it's anything normal about it, Jake, to be perfectly honest. It was, uh, <laughs> it just, this business kind of finds you. It's a weird thing. I mean, you got to be around it 
and you really truly have to love it because it's a grind. I mean, just the business in general, it's 365, seven days a week. Um, you know, even for professional, for professional betters, it's the same. It's, it's not like a, a real, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, glorious life or, or, or real, you know, it's a, it's a working, working grind. And so this finds me and I'm like, yeah, um, sure. I'll try it. And then I, I was down there for almost two years, it was about 20 months. And you see a lot of people come and go, they think, yeah, I'm going to move to the Caribbean. Well, I mean, I literally drove by a beach for three and a half months straight and, um, never, never touched foot on the sand because we were going to work and finally got to, you know, you have a discussion and say, look, we get, we're going to have a day off here. Eventually (laughs) this is, this isn't going to work for me. And we ended up working it out, but, um, you know, between different places all over the world, it, it taught me more about life as much as I learned about the book business. It taught me more about life and just getting out of the, the rat race and the mentality, you know, and living in a place where a dryer was a luxury item. No one, yeah. no one dried their clothes in a dryer. Everyone hung dry everything except, you know, there were a couple places that had one. So it was a very valuable experience and it taught me a lot just in general about life. But man, back in the late nineties, sports book business was booming and you had to learn all aspects of it because the staff was, was no staff of like a hundred. It was a staff of three. <laughs> so you did customer service. You did, um, you know, you did media, you did, you, you had to learn how to make numbers. You had to learn how to book bets. You had to, you had to learn it all if you were going to survive. And I was very lucky. I had a very good mentor and, and survived it as long as I did. I'm interested in the, the making numbers part at that time. What type of things were you doing or what was the norm? Was it what it is today in many respects where you have access to a lot of information? Was it pretty much pre internet as we know it now where you had to do most of it yourself? And, and like you said, you really have to learn on the fly, I'm sure. But tell us a little bit more about that process and how you handled it back then. Uh, I learned from a lot of guys that did it, what I'll call old school. Um, they were, they didn't use computers. They didn't use, there was a lot of yellow legal pads and a lot of pencils. The number two pencils were everywhere and you made numbers and you had to make arguments for those numbers because guys like that believed in their numbers firmly. And now the business is so, you know, algorithms and power ratings and the, the information is readily available on both sides of the counter. Um, so it's way different now. I think I'm in, a, in that age bracket where I can see the, the old school way of doing it, but appreciate the new school way of doing it and kind of meld them both. Like the new stuff is uh, it's more of a tool than a be all end all for me, as well as the old school stuff. I mean, sometimes the old guys just get off my lawn. My number's right. You don't know what you're talking about. They're not right either. So um, it, it's, it's a real art but there's no exact science. There's no one way to do it. You just have to figure out what works best for you. And ideally, when you work at a place, you get a good mix of that. It works out really well. The believe in your numbers philosophy, did that help on the bookmaking side? Because you had that confidence. And I'm guessing if you've got minus 110 on your side and you've got the the house edge and the bookmaker edge, it can often certainly work out. Or certainly over time, the bookmaker is going to be able to outwit and outlast uh, many of the punters. Did you find that that helped on the bookmaking side compared to maybe to today where it's a lot different or it's a, an amalgamation of different tools that you have at your disposal? I would say yes. Um, it, it, the 110 works for you. And that I learned that at a very uh, young age from an old school guy. And you kind of got to learn the ropes a little bit when you bet it. You know, if you if you if you if you bet and you think you're going to go at it, I mean, we've seen a lot of guys come and go as professional bettors, um, and that term is being used very loosely nowadays. Just in general, I mean, within the media, there's guys that are pros that are doing it, and if you, I mean, if you can hold three percent of of your of your weight, you're doing really well. I mean, yeah. it's a hard it's a hard way to go. So you got to know that that one ten is such a hurdle to overcome. So yes, as the bookmaker side, 
you learn to make that 110 work for you. And what I'm finding in the industry is that, yeah, it's, it's still 110, but it's, it's varying. And like, you know, we talked a little about the in-game stuff and, um, it's just different where you got to, you got to use it to your advantage. And it, it, it's a hard mix to get to, but at the same time, it shouldn't discourage like sharp action. And I think books becoming just more risk averse, they don't, they forget that 110 is still working for you. Absolutely. I, I'm, one other thing I wanted to ask about was 20 something year old David arriving, you know, first day on the job, first week, first month. <laughs> Coming from the Northeast, obviously you got the Steelers, you know, the Pirates you talked about. You probably thought you were a sports expert and you may well have been. Tell me about how that translated initially to a, a good employee in the business and, and how that translates generally into betting. Um, it's, a, it's a good base of knowledge to know sports to get into this business. And, you know, at that time... I ended up, you know, training employees and, and trying to just teach them to match Atlanta with Falcons. And they couldn't understand that Atlanta could also have the Braves. And there, there were multiple teams yeah. that had Atlanta as a city. So we're talking on that level. I mean, it was as basic as basic could be. And it was all phones. So they had to talk to everybody. There was no Internet wagering. There was none of that stuff while I was down there. That all came afterwards. So. I don't know for, for people that are looking to get into this business, you have to know sports, but you have to know numbers and you have to pay attention. You can't come in thinking, you know, everything you can't come in and say, well, you know, I bet. So I know what I'm doing. Um, there's so much more to it, but at the same time, just if you're open to watching and what's going on and listening to some people who may have been doing it for a while, like I'm a sponge just in general. I mean, I just love talking the business and I love learning from, I don't ever have to be the smartest person in the room. If you have that mentality, you can learn so much and pick up good traits from everyone and it'll make you better at the job. Um, I mean, people ask me all the time, how do I come out to Vegas and, and get in this business? Everyone that I know that's still in it started as a ticket writer. Every single person started. That's where you, that's the bottom level. You show up, they give you a uniform, you count a drawer, and you start taking bets. And you got to know the difference between straight bets, parlays, teasers. When someone asks a question, and especially on the Las Vegas Strip, how do I do this? I've never done this before, but I want to make a bet. It's a whole kind of script, but at the same time, you got to know what you're talking about and make that experience a very positive one so they'll come back. And you'll stay employed because if you can't answer that, it's a short stint in the book. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that, oh, I want to get to Vegas as well in a moment, but just thinking about your earlier experience, do you think that there is some type of sports betting gene or molecule in your system that allows you to grasp so much? Because I'm guessing, looking back <laughs> at that time, all the, all the elements you needed to be successful, you probably didn't have, or it's impossible to have it at that type of age. But there's just some way that you can will yourself through the, the parts that are difficult and the parts that come more naturally you can excel at. And overall, you, it's, it's amazing sometimes how you can get through all the different tribulations that come with sports betting. Do you think there's some element that's intangible that's just within uh, those that have been in the industry for this long? <laughs> I call it a sickness, Jake. <laughs> we, <laughs> we all have it. Uh, I think you have to have it to survive and you really have to love it. It's just like anything else in life, right? If you really love it, you get through the tough days. You get through, you know, you get through the 0 for fours at the plate when you strike out three times and pop up to the pitcher to get back in the box the next day. Not every day is great. Not every day is bad, but if you love it, you find a way through it and you know, you make your way to, to the next day getting better. I, I we'll get to the future of the business, I would love to hear your viewpoint of it as well, because it's a constant debate, especially like here in Vegas, where it's been established for so long, where this is all going. I have no idea, man. I have no idea. That's the beautiful part. And I want to get to Vegas now. Just set the scene for us, because not everyone 
gets to understand what the what the system and the structure is like behind the scenes at a sports book in Vegas. And you've mentioned ticket writers. You hear, you know, sports book directors. You're obviously odds maker, risk risk analyst. There's a lot of different elements. I'm guessing behind the scenes. Take us through typically what what the structure and what the process is back there, and then we'll get into some of the more nuanced topics after that. Absolutely. So I I end up leaving Curacao. And I go back to Pittsburgh. I moved back there in February and it was nine degrees when I landed. I had just lived in a place that was 72 to 65 degrees every day. I needed to get out. I said, I'm moving out west. I moved to Arizona first, was out of the business, completely out of the business, getting into some sales and marketing golf course. I moved to Vegas coincidentally and just, you know, in in the course of meeting some people, they said, why don't you go? I'm a stay at home dad at this point. And looking for something to do to just get out of changing diapers one or two nights a week. And a guy says, why don't you go down to the sports book director and talk to him about maybe working part time. And I did had a conversation with, uh, his name's Chris Andrews. He's the director at the South point. Now he was at the golden nugget at the time. We knew a lot of the same people. Pittsburgh has a pocket of uh, a lot of the same, same circles kind of, uh, co-join there a little bit. He said, when can you start? I think I'm going to put you through, can you start Saturday? It was Thursday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> I said, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll be here. So that's how I started. And again, that's the ticket writer position. That's the front line at the counter. When you walk into a book, that's who you see. That's who you talk to. That's who you interact with to uh, make a wager and get a paper ticket. Behind them is a supervisor, a line supervisor, which would be a natural progression from being a ticket writer to being a supervisor per se, like in a casino environment, a dealer to being a pit boss kind of situation. So the supervisor is in charge of the employees, making sure all the, the, uh, the ticket windows are taken care of. Everyone's on point, answer any customer questions that go above that level. Um, you know, do all the, uh, know your customer things that the supervisors do from there. You get, um, into the, the risk management side of it is kind of different than the op side of it. There's two sides of a sports book operation. The op side is the actual, you know, on site ticket writer, supervisor, manager positions. That's the hierarchy there from bottom to top. And then in the risk side, um, like, you know, for us at CG, we're in a corporate office. We're not in a book anymore. We used to be in a book and have a hub where you, you know, have your screens, you're sitting in an office environment behind multiple screens, set up however you like. You watch bet tickers, you watch odds screens, you watch, um, you know, some guys use Twitter, some guys use uh, whatever source of news items you use. There's all kinds of options, but you're constantly watching to make sure that things are in line where they're at. And on that side of it as well, there's odds making where you're making numbers, you're keeping power ratings diligently um, updating stuff as they go. And then things happen and you have to adjust on the fly. Like in the, this past summer when Andrew Luck retired a couple weeks before the NFL season started, it was just, it was a summer night when almost everybody was off. Well, we had so many things to adjust between not just Super Bowl odds, AFC championship odds, AFC, uh, South division odds. There were season wins. There were MVP voting. There were quarterback props. It was a zillion things that had to happen. And that's where like the odds making team helps the risk team and kind of co-mingles where you're like, okay, these all have to be adjusted. And, you know, you handle that. So there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of ways to go, but you got to like take the steps necessary. Um, You know, a lot of people think, well, I graduated with a degree in statistics. I'm going to go out and be an odds maker. There's a little more to it than that. That's, That's a good place to start to have the discussions and find your niche. Um, The other aspect of it is this media thing, which has kind of blown up and opened up of which, you know, I'm lucky I have a media background. My my major was broadcast journalism and I had the TV radio stuff. So there's an opportunity for that. If you speak the language, you know, you may get opportunities to be on shows or be on podcasts like this. That is also another way to get your foot in the door into this business. So the, you talked about it earlier, the art versus the science aspect. Today in, in 2019, you know, this football season, is it still 
leaning towards art in your mind when we talk about the odds making and we talk about you know that Andrew Luck example is a perfect one when you all get into the war room whether it is in a uh, an old school war room or more of a corporate environment now is that an art type discussion or are we talking more science now where there are algorithms and there are a lot more systems in place to guide you I can only speak for the ones that I've been in and the one I'm in now is a really good mix of, of guys. Um, the discussion kind of, you know, it, it depends even where you're from. You know, we have some back East guys like myself, you know, New York, New Jersey, and, and we have, uh, you know, some West coast guys that are born and raised in Vegas and you kind of go back and forth and you see the division. What sometimes when you, when you're having an argument, like um, this number can't be three. Well, it has to be three. <laughs> well, they know they're going to bet they're three. You got to make it two and a half, and, you know, and back and forth. And, and so that still happens. And that's really I, I love that part of the job, especially when you actually can get to a number that's right. You know, the market tells you very quickly. That's another very big aspect that's different than back in the day. When you put up a wrong number, you, you get instant feedback from <laughs> from the group of players that you have. They tell you. Right away, within seconds, you know, between the the odd screens, the different feeds, and and everything available, it's available to everybody. You know, right away. Well, we messed that one up. Move it now, and let's try to get to the right number. So that's another fun part of the job. But hopefully, the results kind of go your way more often than not, and you can uh, you can enjoy that aspect of it. But yeah, when you put up a wrong number and it comes in their way. You're kind of reminded about it too, more often than you'd like. So tell me your style and some of your colleagues or some of your compatriots around town. Is there one style of odds making and and being a risk analyst that stands out, or are there many different styles? Whether it's you know others you've observed, other books you've worked at. You know, you talked about Chris Andrews before, and anyone who hasn't read his book should go grab a copy. If you have half the life of that guy, then you're doing all right. But do you think that there's many ways to look at this type of business or do you think there are overarching core elements that, that are consistent throughout? I learned the business, you know, down there in an office. I had no backup of rooms. I had no, you know, restaurant comps. I had no table games to get the money back at or anything. So I really only know one way and that's just what you're doing, the book. Um, so many places, especially, you know, um, in Vegas, you know, have that kind of not that the, I mean, I, and I've heard this term used. The book is an amenity. It's just like the gift shop. Just don't lose and we'll be OK and don't see it as a source of income. Other books, um, you know, we're starting to see this. As, you, and, you know, I'm not bashing anybody, but you see it on Twitter. Um, you see it in social media. The European model is a lot different than that. It's, it feels like it's a lot more risk averse and it's a lot more, we want recreational, uh, I'll use your word punters, uh, more <laughs> often than not, we don't want sharp action. We don't, you, you just, you're, you, you're what, what we're finding or personally, I, I'll, I'll say this, you can't make a snap judgment or, you know, put someone in a profile after three bets. And I'm seeing that happen more and more where, you can beat the closing number. It still has to win. Well, if, if someone beats a closing number three times in a row or four times in a row, they're limited to an amount on a wager that is basically saying, we don't want your action. Or you're just basically told you can have your money, you close your account, and it's a pleasure doing business with you, but we're not taking your bets. And that aspect of it, as far as even making odds, if you make a number, you're confident and put it out there and take bets and, 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 you know, let the guys that do specialize in the bookmaking aspect of it do their thing. And ultimately, the 110 should work for you. Again, we'll go back to that. But to answer your question, it's not – I don't think it's being done everywhere. And, you know, between things auto-moving and like bot betting and uh, all these other things that I know are happening, uh, you just – it's changing the whole industry in general. Well, one thing that strikes me about – Nevada and Las Vegas and the Strip especially is even if you have someone that that might be winning uh, especially if they're coming from out of town there is an argument that they would then if they win 
you know, 10,000 as a sports book on a weekend and they're in Vegas, they might go and have a, a nice lengthy dinner and buy a nice bottle of wine and go to a show. And there are ways to not necessarily recoup the, the losses of the sports book, but that whole idea of an amenity, it seems like it's, it's in the same direction as letting people bet and letting people have a, a fair shot. And obviously not all those who are doing it professionally are going to win at your sports book either. And not all those who are doing it professionally can win at all sports and all the time as well. So with 110 on your side, it seems like especially in the Nevada environment, there would be more openness to allowing a lot more of that as opposed to just like you said, having a sports book where your sole business is a sports book. And if that doesn't go well, then you've got nothing else to fall back on. But it's it's one interesting element about Las Vegas that often comes up in conversations. And I certainly can't get my finger on the pulse with all those different elements and some of the stuff that you've already talked about. It definitely makes, I think it makes you better at your job. Like I say that all the time. I mean, I got to be good at what I do um, if we're taking sharp action. And I've never been at a place that's really discouraged it or basically told people you can't do it. I know, I know we don't. Um, it's on us to manage it. If you beat us to a number, okay. You know, and if you do it consistently, we're really going to take note of it and um, you know try to do our jobs better. But what's changed in the business is that there was always opposing factions. You could move to a number pretty quickly, whether it's a money line, a total, a side, and get the other side. You know, there was always someone who thought they knew something as well, or or, or were just playing numbers. Now, between you know the arbs and the business that way, where they're just scalping a number one way and scalping a number the other way and taking their percentage in the middle, it's really really hard. If you don't get off market or get to a number that just basically is not selling it off, but if you don't get there, there's no buyback. Mm-hmm. You know, I used to say, I mean, in baseball games, you know, if you went to one from 180 to 190 on a game, someone was going to take the other side of that. Now they lay the second number, they yeah. lay the third <laughs> number, and and so now it, it has me questioning all the time. Maybe the numbers, maybe the way we're doing it needs to evolve a little bit too, because there's minimal two way and the other side has never been better as far as their knowledge, their access to information, the better, you know, it's, it's never been more close to being equal if not more. I mean, sometimes the betters are better at it. Like college basketball starts next week. I'm losing sleep over it and breaking into a cold sweat <laughs> every day, knowing what's coming because for the first month or two, we're all guessing except the five guys that know, you know, the American conference or, you know, the Sun Belt, and they know the numbers are just soft and they pick you, they can pick you apart in a, in a matter of a month. Yeah, that's, that's a great segue. I wanted to ask about college. A lot of people seem to be jumping from NFL, NBA sides and totals towards things like college sports, college basketball, college football even, uh, and some other sports. I often use the example of WNBA on the podcast for things that are, there may be enough of a market for a sole proprietor to find their edge and be able to bet enough and make a, a good living out of it. How do, We talked about the broader strategy, but talk about something like college basketball that's coming up. How do you tweak internally your own strategy to deal with what's to come there? And as we all know, there are people and, and syndicates that can be very sharp in things like single conferences or, or single sports like college basketball. Yeah, it's it's a tough spot, especially, you know, for the books, because you want to offer fair limits and you want to, you know, provide as much product as possible. As far as games, you want to offer first halves, you want to offer money lines, you know, up to a certain point spread in the way it starts. And, and I heard this 25 years ago from the guy I learned under if we could just start booking college basketball after New Year's we'd all be better off because it's just such a disadvantage so as a group you know we're really trying to just gain as much knowledge as we can um, you know kind of concentrate divide up the, the the labor you know you stay with the east I'll stay with the west you guys get the SEC and the big 12 and really try to specialize um, I don't know how books do it that offer all the prop bets. Yeah. That's what amazes me. I'm so amazed. And it's a lot of it's got to be automated, right, Jake? I mean, the, there's just too much stuff there for 
I don't think that they have enough staff to do it, right? It has to be automated. Yeah, and another thing that strikes me is if you're a CG technology, you're you're putting up Liberty versus Rutgers college football games. I can't imagine you've got hundreds and hundreds of people that are staying at the <laughs> casino or nearby charging in to bet those games. So you probably have the vast majority of players who are either break even or possibly better than that betting into those types of games. And Rutgers has a new head coach and their quarterback is terrible. And in <laughs> conference, they've scored barely a touchdown all season. And you've somehow got to book that game knowing your clientele is going to be a certain group of people. But you have to put the game up. You have to put the total up. You have to put a first half line up probably. And that's the mandate from above. And that's just what the industry expects. So it's it's not always a perfect situation being a bookmaker, albeit you have the 110 on your side. Were you sitting in our risk room recently? We've had that exact, <laughs> <laughs> we've had that exact discussion week to week as we continue to put up. You know, Liberty Rutgers is a good example. Uh, UMass every week in college. Um, the Miami Dolphins just in the yeah. NFL. It's an unprecedented situation, and we were befuddled the first month just trying to find the number, and it was completely all one-sided action. And that was a public thing. That was a literal. Uh, you know, the NFL is is probably one of the most efficient markets because everybody bets into it. College basketball is such a limited thing. And I mean, perfectly honest, no one really pays attention to it except for a couple big marquee matchups um, at the beginning of the season until conference play, except for those people that are playing it, you know, and have that sort of edge, I'll say. Um, they're very sharp. So, yeah, that the 110 doesn't always work. There's definitely days that, you know, you grade all the games and you go, okay, well, turn the page, we'll get it tomorrow. And you go from there. And then, you know, there are days when the dogs win outright or, you know, the game falls in the, you know, late, you get the cover and things happen right. So, yeah, it's a lot of, you got to be able to ride the wave. But, uh, wow, with all these markets, it's, a, it's getting harder and harder, I'll say. I, I don't think it's getting easier. Absolutely, and and I live in Jersey, and we're obviously seeing that market evolve since the change in PASPA May fourteenth last year. And let me put you, let me put this sort of scenario to you. Let's say you get hired as a consultant to one of the sports books in Jersey that have less than three percent market share. So they're they're obviously their turnover is not enormous, and their hold you know from that may not be enormous. And you've got to come up with a strategy for your sports book where you know you're competing hard with other sports books and you're probably getting a lot of in line with what we talked about with the Rutgers example and Liberty you know you got to make a decision on how you want to book that but just generally in that circumstance you got to make a decision how you want to book because a lot of the the recreational uh, general players are heading towards the the big daily fantasy company brands how do you go about it in that situation is there a is there an easy solution for those types of books moving forward because everyone's talking about consolidation and just thinking from an odds maker perspective, from a sports betting, sports book expert like yourself who's been doing it a while, is there a way to, to exist in that landscape, do you think? Great question. That's a great question, Jake. And I mean, I, I've had this discussion, you know, not only just with my wife, but with other guys in my position, guys that are a little bit older than me. I'm afraid we're going to be extinct as far as odds makers and you know, bookmakers and, you know, trying to convince the top level executives that, you know, sometimes you need to take a position on games and maximize, you know, you're not going to win them all. Um, but if you maximize when you do with the 110, we're going to come out ahead and you're going to get to a percentage that you want. I can't believe what's going on in Jersey. It feels like exactly what went on in the offshore world, um, you know, for me 25 years ago, where the promotion bonuses, and the things like this, the customer acquisition cost has to be through the roof in Jersey. We're kind of sitting back in Vegas. And, you know, some guys have their head in the sand and don't pay any attention to it. I can't get enough of it. I'm, I've been talking about this from the time I was in Curacao. Why don't we do this in different states? Why, why don't we do this in the United States? I can't believe it. So I'm seeing it happen now. And the challenge in Jersey is I think it's so saturated right now. I would tell someone who has the 3% share, um, you have to do something to differentiate yourself. Why don't you take bigger wagers? Why don't you, why don't you welcome some bigger action and allow us to manage the risk? This is what we do because we're going to see it in Vegas. 
where the Super Bowl parties, the March Madness week, especially the first week, they were huge weeks here. Monster. You had to come here. You couldn't go anywhere else. We're going to see it now. Jersey, you don't have to come here for, for the Super Bowl. Jersey's going to have their own. There's so many books, brick and mortar. And then the, the mobile thing. If you don't have mobile, when you start, you're done. You have to have mobile to start. So the books that, that have just the brick and mortar, I think they're behind the eight ball. Um, Jersey, I think that there has to be a way to, to differentiate, differentiate yourself. And I would, I would say, listen, don't shy away from the sharp action. Use it. Take it. Um, maybe take a little higher limits because those places – you see more often than not, they seem more risk averse. Um, welcome players, be consistent, offer the best product, provide the best user experience. I've been told that, you know, these books, they want to see like user engagement on their apps. You know what I want when I go to my betting app, I want it to work and I just want to make a bet and go like, I don't need to see the score. I have somewhere else to see the score. I don't need to see, you know, designs and, you know, make the, the graphics look great. I need to read it and make sure it works. Like I, I equate it all the time to going to a convenience store. I'm going to a convenience store sometimes and I just want a pack of gum and I want to go get it and walk back out to my car. I don't need milk. I don't need eggs. I don't need all that other stuff. I ha- I'll go to the supermarket and get that. And that's fine. So um, I would use the in and out burger method of, of being a sports book. Do one thing great and do it consistently every day, and eventually people will come and people will find you. But it's very, very hard. In a place like New Jersey, man, I don't know. It's, it's a, that, I think that's a tougher market than here because we're constantly getting tourists here, and bringing people in. You can earn customers' business, new people coming all the time. In Jersey, how do you do it, Jake? I don't know. Yeah, it's, a, it's something I often think about and talk about and ask people smarter than I am because it strikes me that they have – two clear paths and maybe there's some other path, other paths or trails I can follow. But if you follow the uh, DraftKings FanDuel comp- competing in that domain and, and following that sort of lead, it's going to be a tough one. And if you go out and try something a little bit different, like what you talked about and accepting more players, being more consistent, having higher limits and things like that, if you're taking 3% of the, the bets that are being placed in Jersey, then it's a high likelihood your entire book or most of your book's going to be sharper players. So you're going to have to manage not only the cream of the crop, but also that middle tier of, of semi-professional and those looking to, to climb up the ladder or the sharp ladder and get to the, the pointy end as well. But it seems like that, albeit it's an incredibly hard road to take, with minus 110 on your side, it might be the best alternative that exists today that, that might make you viable moving forward because competing with some of those other brands that have deep deep pockets and um they're doing a pretty good job at the moment they've got existing brand equity in the market it's an almighty challenge for not you know for have 17 sports books existing is going to be difficult as is let alone trying to be 14 15 16 on that list and then trying to figure out a way to be around in in four or five or ten years time it's a it's an interesting one that's going to continue to to exist for a while i would imagine Seems like you're climbing Mount Everest in that situation. Yeah, yep. So in terms of the future, you talked a little bit about it then and a lot of the discussion from the European side, from most other jurisdictions in the world that have had mobile and online for an extended period, that's that's the way forward. And, and digging in deeper to that, in-play and in-game betting is a large proportion of, of betting and it's no secret that companies that are doing well globally are doing a vast majority of their betting in play and, and whether it is you know Bet365, whether it is Flutter and Stars Group and these companies that have mastered it in other jurisdictions, they're going to continue to push down that avenue, I would imagine, in the US and already are doing that. From your experience and, and what you see in this marketplace and what the, the bettors want, do you think in play and in-game betting is going to be a key part of the future? I absolutely do, Jake, and I'm probably in the minority. Um, I just know it adds something to the experience that for a lot of people is new. For a lot of people, it's scary. It, it's just it's hard to, to watch the game in that social environment and bet it. But if it's available, I think it's a very good um, 
accessory addition to – I don't think it needs to eclipse what it's what we're doing pregame. I think the in-game wagering is definitely um, an aspect of the business that should be concentrated um, on more. But it's it's just so new. And like what the European companies are doing with it as far as like golf, tennis, soccer, that's what it was best designed for. It's very hard to translate to an NBA game where there's 25 lead changes. Um, it's a frenetic pace back and forth. I think if we can take it and adapt it best, like football and baseball with the pace of play is great. And hockey is very similar because there's not a lot of scores on it. Um, but basketball is really the challenge. But I think basketball is where you can, there's so many games. So if you really want to expand your business, I think you need to embrace the in-game wagering aspect of it more than say, you know what, this isn't for us. And it's really hard because it's it's hard to actually, you know, get the fastest feed, get the uh, <laughs> get the fastest feed, and um, you know, manage it. It's it, it's almost like an afterthought, at least initially, right now. But I believe it. I, I'm one of the few guys again in Vegas who go you know what, this is really, one, it's cool, and two, it gives you something to do when you have a bad bet. That's that, that's the way out. So you can kind of change your position and actually enhance a better position sometimes. So I love it. I think it's a way to go. And if you really want to, you know, compete in today's marketplace, I think you have to have it in some aspect. You don't have to do every game and you don't have to do every sport. But big games on TV – big games, um, you know, in certain sports, it's an absolute must. You're missing out on business if you don't do it. Yeah, it's an interesting one, especially given the, the mentality that may exist towards it. It's, it's going to be fascinating to see how it unfolds here in the future. A couple of quick hits before I let you go and before we finish up. I, I would imagine you get a lot of fresh-faced 20-somethings walk into your office looking to get started in this industry or, or ask you for advice? What do you tell those types that you talk to? I tell them you got to, and I hated to hear this when I was this age, but you got to start at the bottom. You really do. Um, you got to come in, listen and learn. And you want to work in a book, learn it. Every as I did every aspect of the job. I did every, I, I started writing tickets, became a supervisor. I actually took a little hiatus Last year, when PASPA opened things up, somebody found me, and I went to West Virginia to be the sports book director in Wheeling, West Virginia. Um, and it was uh, an opportunity to maybe you know live in Pittsburgh, commute to West Virginia. I thought, okay, uh, we'll try it. Didn't work out. I got lucky. I came back and got back uh, you know back in the risk room. But a young young person, you got to just learn. You you probably should learn how to bet, and you don't need a big bankroll. I mean, you can learn this business making five and ten dollar bets. You don't need to be, you know, risking money that you don't have. That's obviously that's that's never the way to go in any aspect of this business. But learn how the business works from a better standpoint, because if you do, you'll be better on the other side of it. Um, you know, pay attention to um, the language, what's new. Follow books. Follow. Listen to podcasts like yours. Listen to our podcast, you know, where we go on and we talk about how lines open, what they move to, what plays may come in, what may not, what we're looking at when we watch games. And, you know, it, it, it becomes very apparent when you start that way. Everyone that I know that's moved up was a ticket writer, but they were probably the best ticket writer at that time in that book. And then they moved up and you can choose to go one of two ways, go the ops way or go the risk management way. There's no one better than the other. Not either one is for everybody, but you'll find your niche that way. It's a long road, but there's a lot of opportunity. And if you're mobile, if you if you don't mind moving to Indiana, if you don't mind moving to the next state that opens up, they need people that have experience and that they can rely on to kind of teach the casino or wherever they're at, the jurisdiction – the business, because a lot of people were saying, yeah, we want to get into the sportsbook business. How do we do it? Well, we'll just bring this guy in and do it. And there you go. 
So you can kind of come in. There's going to be opportunity. You just have to be flexible in what you're doing and where you're going to live. At Sports BK Consig on Twitter, how did the stories come about? Those who already follow you will know that you have some fascinating threads that go on there with some stories. <laughs> what made you put them into the, the public domain and share them with, uh, with the gambling Twitter world? So I've got young kids, um, well, I have a couple teenagers now, but social media is everything. And I was a little bit late to that party. But I started um, – you know, writing on a blog just about like family trips and stories and stuff. And I, and I have such an affinity for writing that uh, someone said, you know what, you should do this on Twitter. And I thought, oh, all right, whatever, let's try it. And I did. And one, if I can write something and almost make myself laugh out loud and share it and make someone else laugh. I mean, my whole goal was to literally make my wife who has been tired of listening to my stories for a long time. If I can make her laugh when I write something, I, it makes me, you know, feel good. So I started writing these things about the conversations that we have in the sports books with customers, with coworkers, opportunities, things that come up, games, bets. I mean, you know, just yesterday I had someone bet a um, hundred dollars on the Bengals and the dolphins back to back to win the Super Bowl. a hundred dollars <laughs> each. They, it's not even a good gag gift, Jake. Like, I don't even know what they were thinking, but if I was in the book, I would have asked them. And that would have been one of the story times that I share on Twitter. So it's at Sportsbook Consigliere. You, you, you nailed it with Sports BK Consig. Um, it's just a lot of fun. It's a fun follow. If you it, And that's what happens, too. I've made a lot of connections via social media um, where – you know, people follow me and then you follow them. And then one thing leads to another and you say, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm coming out. And you know, we missed each other at G2E, but I can't tell you how many people I met that they're like, you're the consigliere. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so it was fun. It was a lot of, you know, we had a blast. We had a, a, a meetup where we got together and just, you know, had drinks and, and told each other stories. And that's what I find fascinating about all this is just the stories behind it. And so that's what I just try to bring on Twitter and you know, who knows where it'll end up, but I'm, I'm posting articles now and, and writing, and you can find them on sportshandle.com. Um, this podcast has come about at Cash Considerations. It's been a blast. I, I really enjoy it. It's awesome. I certainly hope that you do keep it up. And I must ask, Penn State, I think the fifth in the country at this very moment as we record today, <laughs> Ohio State coming up in the next couple of weeks. I think I saw plus 3,300 to win it all. I think there's obviously a path for them to to make the playoff and then it probably takes a win against Ohio state, but thoughts on Penn state this season, is this the year that they can find their way in the playoff and do some damage, maybe get a, a favorable draw against Clemson, if that's even a thing and, and maybe do some damage or what's the, what's the heart say? What does the head say? Uh, the heart says yes, but the numbers say no. <laughs> and I'm, I'm constantly being accused of being a homer as far as Penn State and Pittsburgh sports when we make numbers. And they, you know, they give me a lot of crap for it, and it's a lot of fun. But, man, this game coming up uh, next week against Minnesota at Minnesota is going to be a, a, a little bit of a, an underestimated yeah, tough spot. It's a big game, and it's everything. Two undefeated teams. If you'd have told me before the season that when Penn State went to Minnesota – they would both be undefeated. I would have given you whatever odds you wanted, probably, and I would be having to pay it out because they both are undefeated. If Penn State gets by Minnesota, the, the dream is real. Um, but they're, the look-ahead line for the Ohio State game, Penn State is traveling to Columbus. It's 14. That's how good Ohio State is. I can't believe it. I told the guys in the room. I'm taking the 14. If you guys want to put that up, I'm taking the 14. And you can't bet at your own shop. That's completely, you know, violation. So you find it somewhere else. But um, that's a big number. And I don't think it's right. I think it'll come a little bit lower, especially if Penn State continues. And Ohio State has – they have Rutgers in Maryland after their bye. So they're only going to be 50-point favorites in both <laughs> games. And they're going to probably cover both games. So maybe the number will come that high, Jake. But, yeah, my heart is – is really with Penn State. I, I would love to see it happen. I've been to games in Columbus. Uh, obviously, I'm biased, but Penn State's the best venue I've ever been to, and those whiteout games are incredible. But asking this year's Penn State team to go to Ohio State's going to be a really tall task. 
Well, good luck. And I, I there were musings <laughs> amongst my friends recently about the, the going to a whiteout game uh, this year, and then hopefully uh, it's on the agenda the next couple. But go follow you, Sports BK Consig. Uh, certainly follow along the the GT Cash Considerations podcast. It's a fun listen every week. Much different to what else is out there, and I certainly enjoy it. So keep up the good work. Thanks for coming on the podcast. It was great fun chatting. Appreciate it, Jay. Keep doing what you're doing, too. Um, it's really a pleasure to hear different aspects of this business. You know, from from your interviews and stuff, you get a lot of taste of things outside of what's going on, especially here in Vegas, but in the United States in general. So appreciate you having me on, and uh, thanks. We'll, we'll hopefully get to do it again. 